Step one in the simplicity of negotiation is very simple. Know where you're going to land. One of the greatest distinctions of us as a species is our capacity and our ability, unique only to us, to offer up different choices, right? And negotiation is not a straight line. Negotiation is not a one-size-fits-all. I could tell you all day long five really scalable, simple steps to negotiate, but you have to remember, point A usually starts here, point B goes here, but the real point B is usually here. Much better than here, but it's not in, this, in a straight line. If you think in terms of knowing where you're going to land, it could be as simple as knowing your price. I'm sitting in the office yesterday with, with Josh and Jordan and Connor, and one of them says to me, I'm going to go buy a new car this month. My lease is up soon. And I start thinking, bam, negotiate. This is my, this is my jam. Let's do this. For that person, it was as simple as what I want to pay. I said, this is what you should do. Think in terms of that. This is where you're going to end up. Now you know you don't start there, right? You do something that's called pre-cycling. Pre-cycling. I wish I could take credit for it. It's, uh, it's something that comes from the Hoffman process, which, is, which, which basically has to do with our neural pathways. It's that same feeling when you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you see red lights in the, in the rearview mirror. Remember that feeling? Mm -hmm. If I say to you, step into my office. Now, I might be giving you a raise, but that's not your first neural pathway, is it? It's I'm in trouble, right? Those neural pathways are modified if you pre-cycle. If you live through that moment prior to getting there, that's a pre-cycle. So when I'm negotiating, let's say I'm negotiating, let's take the car for example, okay? I want to pay X, they want me to pay Y. I'm going to start off, in my mind, knowing where I want to end up and, and pre-cycle that conversation, that scenario, to where I know the back and forth before I already start there. You know, you're never going to see an open door unless you sort of think about where you want to end, right? There's, there's, this, there's this, this piece in knowing all's going to be okay if I end here at X. Well, when you start seeing a crack in the door during negotiation to get you that X, it's a natural progression. Sometimes knowing where you're going to land is as simple as what you're willing to pay for something. Sometimes it has to do with, with a full-blown battle plan, if you will. And this is when you pre-cycle. It is, it is maybe the most simple process in the five-step plan, but is perhaps the most critical. Because if you do not know where you're going to land, and this is honest to goodness, again, I go back to radio and television. When you get on the air, there's so many times you could just go and start talking, and if you don't know where you're going to land, you're in big trouble by the time that 30-second break comes up. In negotiation, knowing where you're going to land comes down to really reliving how you want it to end. It doesn't mean it's going to end that way. In fact, most times it doesn't end that way. But I will tell you, if you start at 100 and you want to end at 100, you're going to end at 150. Let me break that down for you. So how does a guy with a very eclectic beginning uh, who quit college a semester shy of a double major in journalism and music with zero financial background, how does a guy like that raise a third of a billion dollars? How's a guy with zero broadcast experience end up uh, in 175 countries and all the ships at sea on the radio in 100 million TV homes? It's easy. I negotiated it. There was no luck here. There was no it's who you know here. It's about understanding what I call the simplicity of negotiation. And that's why I'm so excited to be here today. I'm excited to share that with you to get you in your business, your outcome, your life, where you want to be. I'm going to be your personal Siri. I want, I want you to be able to, to, to say, hey, Sully, negotiate me a seven-figure deal. Hey, Sully, negotiate me a better outcome. You know, a contract is not the only outcome of a negotiation. You know, one of the greatest stories in the art of negotiating comes out of a guy who was a full-blown geek. He was a Trekkie. He was attributed by saying something like, be nice to nerds, you might be working for somebody, this is one of them someday. It was Bill Gates. The Trekkie, Bill Gates, the, the, I think they made the movie The Nerds based upon the pocket protector and the short sleeves, Bill Gates. Here's a kid, 24 years old, 
who is the epitome of, of that guy in high school, sitting across from Big Blue, negotiating something more than money. Negoti the fact that we're here tonight, the, the fact that the technology we're using today, the cell phones in your pocket that are buzzing right now, is a direct result of that negotiation, whereby Bill Gates talks the director of digital development of IBM and their entire board of directors into using his operating system, Microsoft's operating system, which at the time was called MS-DOS, for those of you who remember, using that as the operating system in every personal computer, and it changed the world. That negotiation was way more than a contract. It's a classic story. And of course, it shows you that negotiating a better outcome is attainable to anybody. He had zero business experience. He had a lot of brain power, and he understood the simplicity of negotiation. Then there's the story of, of me and the time that I stepped in it and smeared it in the carpet. You know, for those of us who consider ourselves successful negotiators, sometimes we even lose track of our process. It was the worst negotiation of my life. It was early in my television and radio career. And I was going for an opportunity of a lifetime, frankly. In that business, it's interesting where we're just people and all of a sudden you get a call from a producer of late night or a producer from, in this case, it was politically incorrect, Bill Maher. And you're pinching yourself going, don't these guys really know that I'm just a dude? And sure enough, I was end up in a green room. And here I am in the green room. Green room is that place you sit right before you go on stage or before they audition you. So here I am in the green room and sitting next to me is this kid who is way better dressed than I am, way better looking than I am, and, and kind of cheesy, and his name was Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> and, and I was a talk radio guy in San Diego and LA, and he was a, a music DJ, and there's, they're two separate things, but we're sort of in the same business. Well, Bill Maher, as you know, is a, is a notable liberal in this world, and a, just like Rush Limbaugh is a notable conservative, and I was kind of right down the middle. But I was so impressed with Bill Maher and so impressed with the opportunity of getting there that I completely lost my process. And as a result of that, I let my emotions get in the way. And you know the end of the story, because every one of you know who's, who Ryan Seacrest is, mm -hmm. most of you know who Bill Maher is, and none of you have ever seen me before. <laughs> As you can see, if you embrace the negotiating skills that Bill Gates had versus the complete ball drop, the complete biff that I did, just because I got emotional, I got excited, I forgot my process, you can get unbelievable outcomes. Whether it's in your life, whether it's in your business, whether it's with your family. The fourth step in this simplicity of negotiation is take it off the table. And I'm going to tell you off the bat, it's the toughest thing you'll have to do in negotiation. It's the toughest, and, and I don't mean just business negotiation. I'll bring you back to one of my daughters who was in a relationship with a great kid, and they were doing this. And I, you know, I, I, had, to pull out, I had to pull out the unfair negotiation card, and I said, honey, go dark on him. Do the no contact for just three days. Watch what happens. And of course, the pendulum swings in the other direction. It's the toughest thing she ever did, but she won that negotiation. Robert Greenleaf once said that when you're making an important decision, it's not a function of you having 100% of the information. It's a function of the other side thinking that you have 100% of the information. I'm going to teach you a principle that I learned from a guy who I just geek out on. His name is Tom Hopkins. He wrote the book, How to Master the Art of Selling Anything. And one of his principles stuck with me forever, and it is literally critical to taking it off the table, and it's called, he who speaks first loses. Now, it could seem like five days, and it's only 30 seconds, but he who speaks first, it'll be the longest 30 seconds of your life. Sometimes you have to walk away completely, though. Sometimes you have to take it off the table for a number of days. Sometimes it's just a function of making them wait. Waiting hurts. But not knowing which decision gets people completely off of their heels. It's the most painful. You see, we lament our losses three times more than we celebrate our gains. Think about that. We, we are way more bummed about when the team loses than, when, than excited when they win. 
I'm a big believer in ethical negotiation. Nothing I'm talking about today is meant to put you in a position to put yourself into a win-lose situation where you're taking advantage of somebody. But sometimes you gotta let them load their own gun. Sometimes you gotta let the noise happen in their head without you saying anything. Look at any deal, all's well that ends well, regardless of the noise, regardless of it seems like this guy's gonna hate me. Look, you both are negotiating in good faith. You're both trying to get to the same direction. But at some point, you need to understand something that's called emotional intelligence, EQ. You have to get into their, into their kitchen. You gotta figure out, okay, where is this guy, gal coming from? Because look, it's the end of the day, you're manipulating for a good cause. You're not manipulating for harm. You're not manipulating to steal. You're not manipulating for bad. You're manipulating so you can get a better outcome. And by the way, again, like I told you in the beginning, if it's not a win-win, it's not worth doing. Sometimes taking it off the table is as simple as not seeming too eager. It doesn't have to be complicated. I want you to do one thing. In the next 24 hours, why this is fresh in your mind, why the five steps in the simplicity of negotiation is right there, front and center, I want you to start to pre-cycle. Pre-cycle. Live that moment before you get there. Get that outcome in your head. Again, it doesn't mean that's where it's going to end, but if you start to know where you want to end, the rest of that story can be painted well ahead in advance. Whether it's hiring a new candidate, whether it's landing a new client, whether it's negotiating better M&A, whether it's, it's dealing with your team, whether it's negotiating with somebody in your family, I want you to pre-cycle that scenario in advance. Do it now. Start today. Start right now. Put yourself in that position. Pre-cycle even the conversation. Put yourself in the scenario where you're sitting, where you're going to be, what it looks like, what they look like. I'm telling you that three minutes is going to make all the difference in the world for laying out the rest of this negotiation. So as I've shown you, if you can negotiate better outcomes for yourselves, if you can negotiate a better outcome for your company, if you can negotiate a better outcome for others, we're all going to see better companies. We're all going to see better economies of scale, better creativity, better communication, better relationships, better outcomes, better governments, better parents, better partnerships, and best of all, better bottom lines. Thanks for listening.